Hello. Quay, good afternoon. Bonjour. My name is uh, Tiger Levi, and I'm the co-founder of the podcast, uh, Looking Forward. Um, welcome to the first part of the public dialogue on racism in the Canadian school and university system. This public dialogue is the first in a series of eight dialogues on the topic of hate and racism uh, in, in Canada, organized by Cohesia, with the support of the Foundation uh, Communitaire de la Pensola Acadian. Uh, and funding received to the Canadian Race uh, Relations Foundation. It is my pleasure to host this dialogue today with uh, Eli Nadala, PhD candidate. Welcome, Eli. Oui, Tiger. Uh, good afternoon. Bonjour. Uh, Je suis très heureux d'être ici avec vous aujourd'hui uh, en direct d'Ottawa, territoire non cédé de la nation algonquine Anishinaabe. Et j'aimerais simplement saluer uh, tous ceux et celles qui nous joignent de près ou de loin. Merci. Uh, I join you today from Fredericton, New Brunswick, uh, and I want to begin this public dialogue by acknowledging that I am standing here today on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Wallistoe people. This territory is covered by the Peace and Friendship Treaties originally signed in 1725 by the Wallistoe, the Mi'kmaq, and the Passamaquoddy people uh, with the British Crown. It should be remembered that these treaties were not intended uh, to deal with the transfer of lands uh, and resources, but rather uh, to, uh, to recognize holistic Mi'kmaq in Passamaquoddy title, and also to set the rules uh, for the long-term relationship between the nations and the relationship of reciprocity rather than fiduciary. I am grateful that we can all virtually meet here today, and I invite each uh, each of you to write in the chat room uh, from which unceded in ancestral territory uh, you'll be joining us today. Uh, J'aimerais maintenant vous faire part de quelques informations au sujet du programme qui va suivre. Donc, euh, sachez tout d'abord qu'un service de traduction en anglais et en français, mais aussi en mi'kmaq, vous est offert. Donc, euh, si vous nous suivez depuis Zoom, euh, pour en bénéficier, il vous suffit simplement d'activer la fonction interprétation euh, qui se trouve au bas de votre écran avec le globe. Euh, et vous pouvez aussi participer activement tout au long du dialogue en commentant dans la fonction de clavardage ou encore en écrivant votre question euh, à l'aide de la question de la fonction Q&A foire aux questions. Et euh, sans plus tarder, je repasse la parole à Tiger qui va nous présenter le format du dialogue. Up to you, Tiger. Thank you. Uh, the purpose of the dialogue, uh, organized by uh, Cohesia, is to obtain a better understanding uh, of the subject, um, not to reach a resolution. If at the end of the dialogue you feel that you have learned something, then we have accomplished our mission. Please also know that uh, we publish reports on each of our dialogues and that these are shared uh, with stake, uh, stakeholders and are available to the public via our website. A basic rule of thumb before we uh, begin, uh, is that we encourage everyone to be respectful and courteous in posting their comments. Uh, the following will not be tolerated and will be systematically deleted. Uh, defamatory, abusive, and obscene comments, discriminatory statements based on gender, religion, nationality, or sexual orientation, among others, and statements that incite hatred or violence. With this in mind, let's get to the heart of our matter, and I leave the floor to you, Eli. Thank you, Tiger. Donc, euh, en organisant ce dialogue public, euh, nous souhaitons euh, faire la lumière sur la manière dont se manifeste le racisme euh, dans le système scolaire euh, et universitaire canadien. Et puis, dans cette première partie, euh, nous établirons en fait un état des lieux éclairé, euh, notamment par les témoignages de, des invités qu'on a avec nous aujourd'hui. Euh, donc, on a le plaisir d'avoir euh, Michael Diamond, qui est enseignant au Nouveau-Brunswick, um, hello, Michael. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to participate in this public exchange. We really appreciate it. And I see uh, Ted Harris, qui est fondateur et directeur exécutif de Youth Ambitions au Nouveau-Brunswick. Uh, hello, Ted. Thank you so much for joining us. Et puis, on aura aussi avec nous Carrie Daniel, qui est PDG, directrice exécutive et fondatrice, co-fondatrice de Parents of Black Children. Et uh, Carrie nous joindra vers 13h30, heure de l'Ontario. Donc, euh, encore une fois, j'aimerais souhaiter la bienvenue. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Euh, merci d'avoir accepté d'être présent avec nous aujourd'hui. Euh, juste avant d'aller plus loin, j'aimerais juste préciser que demain, nous nous pencherons sur l'impact du racisme euh, qui peut avoir des conséquences sur plusieurs générations et lèverons aussi le voile sur quelques pistes de solutions qui ont été développées à travers le Canada. Euh, mais aujourd'hui, euh, 
nous sommes ensemble jusqu'à 14 heures environ, heure de l'Atlantique, et nous avons beaucoup de choses à nous dire, j'en suis sûr. Euh, donc, je ferai de mon mieux pour être euh, le gardien du temps. Donc, sans plus, par, sans plus tarder, euh, I give the floor to you, Tiger. Uh, thank you, Eli. Uh, to begin, I would like to suggest that we hear from uh, Michael Diamond. Michael, you were a teacher in New Brunswick, and the reason you chose this profession was because you wanted to act against racism uh, in the school system. Uh, would you be able to tell us a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. So, hi, everyone. My name is Michael Diamond, and I was born and brought up in Woodstock. I have faced systemic racism ever since I started going to school. I hated school and I disliked or at least didn't feel comfortable with most of my teachers, but I was a good student. Racism got real and reached new levels of ignorance in high school. As a little kid at age seven, when the principal would softly tell me to stop fighting when kids would call me the N word, um, because I would always be a nigger, I didn't know any better. I was too young to understand it. In high school, I fully understood the ignorance of my English teachers asking me to stand up and repeat the N word out loud as the only black student, as I read from books like To Kill a Mockingbird and Huckleberry Finn. Teachers never heard the impact they had on my friends. So for instance, one day in the cafeteria where I normally sat with a group of friends, I had one of my good friends stand up and he said, uh, so, hey, Mike, why don't you talk like a nigger? Um, you're, you're like Jim. Why don't you talk like Jim? You're a nigger, I'm sorry. My self-confidence had reached new lows because of our public education system. I saw that change was needed and I decided to become a teacher to bring about change for visible minorities. Unlike my aunt Pat who moved to Nova Scotia to teach, I wanted to stay home. I believe most visible minorities do not enjoy their public education experience. And therefore, after they get their diploma, they take off, they leave. Most visible minorities never consider pursuing a career in education, which simply leaves our education system staffed with only white people, one perspective at the top, those who end up making all of the decisions for our youth. Thank you, Michael. Um, how does racism manifest itself uh, in the Canadian school system? Could you give us some examples of uh, barriers you faced? Yeah, I, I have faced a lot of barriers, uh, to be honest with you. Um, a lot of systemic racism throughout my teaching career. I was shocked to learn that some of the winter carnival activities that uh, took place when I was in junior high school, such as those uh, mock slave auctions, they were actually coming from adults, educated adults, the teachers. And I didn't realize that until I started, you know, when, once I was a teacher and I was in the staff meetings. I have also been formally investigated for violating policy 701 five times and all five allegations were connected to anti-Black racism. For example, a young Indigenous boy in my classroom, he was grabbed by the throat and shoved into a locker and told, get out of my way, Black boy. And this was all under newly installed security cameras in the hallway. I sent the student to the office but he quickly came back. In fact, I couldn't believe that he even had time to make it to the office. And I asked him, I said, so what was the consequence? And he shrugged and he said, nothing. And I said, okay, I said, come see me at noon. The end result of that ended up being that a file, that a, a policy 701 complaint 
was made against me and I was formally investigated. What that looked like is they ended up taking my keys, they confiscated my computer, they escorted me to the door. And then I ended up being formally uh, questioned and interrogated. The principal asked me at the time why all black people used the race card. She was never investigated. In fact, she ended up getting awarded educator of the year. When I complained to the superintendent about the ongoing acts of racism, I was transferred to another school. So I ended up going from Woodstock, uh, Woodstock Middle School to Heartland Community School. In Heartland, I was a technology teacher. And so because of that, I was provided with software that would allow me to monitor all computers in the lab. Despite having digital screenshots of racist content, racist comments coming from various students, they never, they never imposed any, any consequence. They didn't educate. So at one point, the principal called me to uh, her office for a meeting. In her office, in the presence of the acting vice principal, she informed me that she Googled the N-word and that it was considered an acceptable term because it derives from Black people. That's what my principal told me. The acting vice principal spoke up and said, Mike, where have you been? Come on down to the gym sometime and listen to some of the music we play. The word nigger is everywhere. I couldn't believe it. I just could not believe what I was hearing. Again, these were educated people. These were administrators. And this is how they were treating me. So what I did is after I took some sick time, I ended up involving the acting director of education. The acting director of education called a meeting in Heartland. And in a short time, she went on to say that uh, I needed to show administrators more respect and that maybe I wanna consider starting a culture club. When everything was said and done, that principal who Googled the N-word and tried to tell me that it was appropriate, she ended up retiring without any investigation. And in fact, she left a digital footprint. They could have easily investigated that, but they chose not to. The acting vice principal, he is now the principal. So he's been promoted. So instead of any sort of investigation like they did to me five times, he got promoted. And then the acting director of education, who told me to respect, show more respect to my educate to my administrators, she's now been promoted to a, a director of education. And she's actually filled in for the superintendent. So that's been how I have seen and what I've experienced when it comes to racism as a teacher. Uh, are you still uh, teaching today? And if so, what steps have you taken? No, unfortunately I'm not, even though that was a dream. That was my goal. Uh, thank you, Michael, um, for sharing. Uh, your... I'd like to finish, please. I'm so sorry. And in 2014, I was offered a confidential settlement agreement. For past wrongdoings, I never signed it.
because the superintendent would not commit to cultural sensitivity training for all teachers, and he would not commit to removing all books containing racial slurs. I was offered an office position with perks. The perks included no bells, no parents, no administrators, flexible work hours. I could get up and I could go for walks. After I accepted the superintendent's offer without signing the confidential settlement agreement, my reality kicked back in. And I found myself in a small, dirty office with no windows. I was also placed under the supervision of some, someone who did not even answer to the superintendent. So it was just like I just got shuffled out of the district. The former vice principal, and by the way, the school in Heartland where the principal Googled the N-word, there was also another vice principal who accommodated two students who did not want to be taught by a black man. He accommodated them by keeping them in their off in his office during my classes. That same former vice principal, he was promoted to principal at another school. But while I was at this office position, I was called to a meeting for this announcement. The announcement included that that same guy who accommodated these two students who did not want to be taught by a black man, he was now promoted again as acting director of education, which meant that he was now going to be working in the same office building. That also meant that I had to possibly face him every day. And this again was for past wrongdoings. This was to re-traumatize me. What I did is I filed a human rights complaint on December 14th of 2021. So I've now been waiting for over 16 months. It contains 321 pages consisting of about 20 hours of recorded video, or I'm sorry, recorded audio. And it includes about 150 email showing a paper trail of asking the superintendent, the director of education, and the executive director of the New Brunswick Teachers Federation to address systemic racism. As for the union, the executive director has been recorded referring to me as a nigger. That's right, even the top person of the union that I've paid dues to has been recorded using the N-word. Both respondents, the New Brunswick Teachers Federation and the New Brunswick Department of Education have been hiding behind their team of lawyers who are funded by taxpayers. My family and I have not deserved this, and we have struggled because of this ignorance. Our youth deserve so much better. Thank you, Michael, uh, for sharing your lived experience with us today. Thank you. We applaud your courage uh, and we support the steps that you have undertaken or undertook to uh, denounce your oppressor. Thank you so much. Thank you again, just going to echo Tiger's word and um, remind everyone that it takes a lot of courage to step up. And the reason why we're able to have this dialogue is even more telling um, and it shows us that uh, silence is no longer enough. Um, so thank you again. Um, let's move on to uh, Ted Harris. Um, hey, Ted, you are uh, the founder and uh, executive uh, um, director of Youth Ambitions in New Brunswick. Um, you also accompany and support uh, Michael in his fight. So uh, my first question for you is simply, well, what is your view of racism in the New Brunswick school and university system, and, and then more generally in Canada? And then how do you explain why it's so difficult to assert your rights as a victim? 
Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ted Harris. I am the executive director of Youth Ambitions. Uh, before I actually answer that question, I just want to give you some background on Youth Ambitions um, and why um, it was formed in the first place. Uh, I echo everything that Michael um, and Michael Jr. has gone through. Uh, I grew up in Truro um, and went through the school system in uh, Truro, which was rife with systemic racism, um, to the point that I actually left school at age 14 and never returned because of it. Uh, my own teacher called me the N-word, uh, and I had no support to no background in Truro. And if anyone's from Truro, you know that uh, it is full of different uh, uh, cultures. Um, but it is rife with uh, the racism that is there. Uh, not only that, but later on throughout my life and my career uh, um, led me to multiple uh, uh, jobs, multiple skills that I learned throughout the way, uh, which led me to a job um, in which uh, there was systemic racism and racism happening within my job, uh, with my supervisors, with my coworkers, uh, because I am biracial. Um, which led to me quitting my job, um, going through human rights, um, in which human rights was not supportive. Uh, it even came to a long drawn out battle where I just gave up. And that's what's actually what's happening with a lot of uh, Black Canadians or any other uh, racialized Canadians is we are having these problems, we are experiencing these problems, uh, and we are going to the organizations that are in charge to help us through these problems but they are dropping the ball time and time again. Uh, my only hope is that even this platform that we are using today isn't just another platform that we set and talk uh, about all of our experiences. I really hope that when we sit down and talk about these issues that we actually come with uh, some definitive um, um, solutions that will help New Brunswickers. Um, and we'll be able to uh, uh, collaborate with all of the leaders that are joining us today and those who are watching um, to help us really try to uh, uh, find a way to eliminate the systemic racism that is happening in New Brunswick. So to get in on that, uh, racism in New Brunswick is rife uh, and it exists on a multi-dimensional proportions. The daily evidence that Youth Ambitions is receiving is crystal clear for every well-meaning New Brunswicker uh, and Canadians in general to see. So sadly for Youth Ambitions, there seems to be a deliberate attempt to sweep a very important issue under the carpet and carry on like it doesn't matter, just like what has happened with Michael Diamond uh, and Michael, uh, uh, Michael Jr. Uh, these lies and misconceptions that have sh have been shoved down the throat of the minority in the popular media to paint a picture of lies and deceit, which are transcendent uh, into the retention and obsolete policy um, that are ambiguous and impractical towards helping racialized students in the educational sector. It's not surprising that this has also cut across all strata of society in forms of systemic racism. Uh, this is the major reason why asserting your rights as a victim uh, is very tedious as the educational policies on racism are either flimsy or very non-existent. Uh, this has made it extremely difficult uh, for youth ambitions to pursue those rights to a positive legal conclusion. Uh, our youth, our uh, youth ambitions sets daily with the youth in the schools, um, hearing the stories that they are receiving, just like Michael Diamond and Michael uh, Jr. Uh, and we've had to try to combat not only the system, um, but also try to support these students through a long, tedious uh, uh, um, fight. And that's really what it is. Uh, our leaders that are in charge, which we're talking about our governments and even some of our organizations that are, are stepping up to the plate, uh, we come with some pretty great uh, ideas and a lot of good talk. Um, but I'll be honest, I, uh, I, I'm not seeing a whole lot of walking. Uh, even as myself working in the schools, uh, we are alone. Uh, there's two of us. I have a partner. Uh, his name is Martin Spashimi. Uh, which represents the Nigerian Association, Canadian Nigerian Association of New Brunswick. 
Um, and we are fighting uh, uh, on a grassroots level on a daily basis, uh, um, supporting youth, supporting families like Michael Diamond, um, and trying to uh, 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 find the resources that are non-existent for uh, all of our uh, uh, communities out there that are, are uh, racialized. Um, and it's time to step up. It's time to look at um, um, certain individuals um, that are fighting, like Michael Diamond, um, who has chosen not, uh, not chosen, but has been forced not to work, um, forced out of his dream job. Um, the financial strains on Michael Diamond alone is 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 to a point, and 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 I I can actually relate to that because there was a time when I was unemployed and fighting uh, human rights and fighting uh, the company that uh, uh, had uh, uh, pretty much used something I couldn't control as a joke on a daily basis. Um, and it got to a point where financial strains were so hard that I had no choice but to give up on my fight. And I'm very sorry that that has happened. However, um, it is because of that that Youth Ambitions was formed in the first place so that we can actually set up, stand up and support and provide resources. However, we're alone. Uh, even as an organization is Youth Ambitions, I'm currently working at another company in order to help support the policies of youth ambitions, because there isn't funding for us. There isn't a way to go to governments and say, this is what's happening. Uh, and youth ambitions isn't ready or willing to jump through any hoops or loops in order to uh, deal with these matters that shouldn't be dealt with in New Brunswick. Um, so we fund through businesses, we fund through donations, we fund the best way we can so we can help support people like Michael Diamond uh, and, and Michael Jr. Um, and I'm telling you, it is a losing battle sometimes, but we are here to fight. We are, we're here because we are right. Uh, and we are here to make sure that the youth voices and our community members voices and our elders voices are heard and that they're implemented at a group grassroots level. Thanks so much for that uh, answer, Ted. You, you kind of elaborated already on my second questions. It, it was, um, the second one was about youth ambitions. Um, so I don't know if uh, we think about um, younger people experiencing racism on a daily basis, not having the resources. Um, what could you tell them or what? how could they reach out to Youth Ambitions? Uh, well, Youth Ambitions right now is in our schools. So most of our students, uh, especially in the greater uh, Moncton area, um, we're going, we go as far as Salisbury, uh, Shediac. Uh, we have other uh, um uh, liaisons that are working in Miramichi right now uh, in St. John and Fredericton. Um, however, uh, uh, one of the things I've noticed uh, working in this field, especially in uh, um, major cities is, yeah, there are racial issues and systemic racism happening in uh, these greater cities, um, but it's really, really, really evident and really visible in our rural areas. So we're talking about uh, uh, Woodstock, Bathurst, Mer uh, even as far as Miramichi and the older area, Chackadee, all those other small little places, there just absolutely is no resources. Like Michael Diamond having to come to Moncton Youth Ambitions for support. I mean, we're talking hours away if you know where we're from. Um, but that's just the way it is right now. Youth Ambitions is really the only organization right now that is at a grassroots level dealing with these on a daily basis, hearing the stories, hearing the stories from the families um, and implementing them in the school boards, uh, implementing them. Uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit about what Youth Ambitions does for the youth. So in Youth Ambitions, we are poised to have been at the forefront in helping not just black youth, but every youth and adolescent identifying as a, a visible minority. Uh, these include blacks, Asians, uh, indigenous people, Muslims, and et cetera. Uh, by providing support both through uh, to the youth and their parents in the schools and the justice system in the greater Moncton region. Uh, these supports are, uh, include, but are not limited to, listening and educating and mentoring on the right ways to stand up and speak for themselves. Uh, we also do so by also creating awareness in the schools on issues bothering uh, uh, on race. Uh, we deal with uh, uh, direct 
uh, problems in the schools. And right now, the biggest problem we have in all of our schools right now across the boards are the youth, uh, the N-word being used, uh, youth being called monkeys, uh, our native, uh, native population being called savage on a daily basis through the hallways. Uh, our books that are being presented to our students uh, during, uh, let's say, Black History Month uh, are rife with words, um, Negro, nigger, uh, uh, um, and our teachers, our educators do not know how to navigate that. So we sit down with our, our educators, we sit in staff meetings, we do uh, staff full meetings in cultural sensitivity uh, on white privilege, we do book studies. Uh, we've done multiple book studies across the boards with uh, all of the staff um, trying to uh, uh, educate on race and what that means to us in our cultures and, and in our communities and how we, how they as a white culture, how they perceive and, and try to have those, those talks. Uh, the next step is to challenge everyday racism and discrimination and escalate the same for proper resolution. Uh, we try to use restorative practices uh, in order to deal with uh, the racial matters that are happening in our schools. The systemic issue of having uh, uh, policies placed in our schools right now where a youth can get suspended for five days for vaping in the bathroom. However, a youth gets a two day school and suspension uh, for calling someone nigger in the hallways. So that is a, a very clear line policy issue that we see. Uh, and in our case, the example was that youth um, that received the racial words towards that, that youth um, watched as the uh, um, youth was in a in school uh, uh, um, suspension and smiled at this youth every single day uh, after calling this youth uh, 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 a nigger. Uh, not only that, that same youth that was called a nigger um, two days later, got caught in the bathroom smoking a vape, and that youth was suspended for five whole days out of school. Uh, and if you can just imagine um, those who uh, 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 that youth uh, identified with the Nigerian family community, you can just tell how bad that would be for that youth to get home and suspended for something like that and the repercussions that they also received at home. Um, or uh, we organize diversity festivals in our school. We're actually uh, forming our second one in our school uh, for the second year in a row. Uh, we hold regular assemblies in our school, presenting topics on res uh, racism and uh, a view of changing perspective and get more white allies um, in our schools. We're creating allies. We're, we're, we're changing teachers into reachers. That's our motto. We already have teachers. That's what's happening right now. Our teachers are teaching from books. They're teaching from uh, 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 maybe their own experiences. And in this case, because it is a white dominant uh, uh, education field right now, they're coming from uh, a, a colonism uh, perspective, which is what uh, our schools are actually based on. The foundation was created when colonism and, and they were taking natives out of homes and telling them not to uh, 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 to forget their language, their culture. This was the time when they actually created our education system and we're still operating on it today, which is a big issue. Uh, we set up, uh, like I said, uh, book studies with staff on ra racism. Uh, we set on a panel. Uh, currently right now, uh, uh, we're on a panel with the school board looking at the uh, systemic racism report of New Brunswick that was issued in 2022 with, uh, I think it was 93 recommendations. So we're setting on the board, the school board here in the greater Moncton region, looking at those recommendations, finding out where those recommendations need to go in order to be implemented, and then actually forcing those organizations to do so. So we're, we're trying to uh, uh, really at the grassroots, but we're no longer okay with being asked to come to the table to give suggestions. We're trying to find a spot, at, a seat at the table for those decisions. We wanna make those decisions for all black youth, all black lives, all minorities in New Brunswick um, to ensure that we all feel safe, we're all heard and we're all doing it. 
uh, helping marginalized youth to go through hurdles and probations in the justice system. We're walking through them through the court procedures. We're going to legal aid services with them to ensure that they're not being pushed through the system with fines because that's the biggest thing right now. The way the system, the, the system works right now is how quickly they can get those uh, uh, those cases out of there and usually it is let's look for a fine not looking for the right way uh, 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 to to especially those victims that are are innocent uh, they're 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 being made to accept guilty uh, 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 pleas and take a fine in order to just move it along uh, so we fight them we go to the, the to the uh, uh, courts we set in front of the judge we 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 try to give those stories and in and, and hopes that at one point we actually have a, a, a judge that actually has a lived experience. And that's the biggest problem we have right now. We have no uh, uh, lived experiences in our education staffing. Very few Black, uh, Indigenous, uh, Asian community, all those uh, 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 cultures, it's very small. It is a white dominant school. Uh, and we're trying to have lived experiences so that our students know that when they are sitting in a guidance counselor's room and they're telling them about these issues that they're having uh, and the racial issues, that they're not talking to a white person who wouldn't understand what that meant and how impactful that was. Instead of uh, uh, labeling our youth that are receiving these issues as as violent youth because there is no supports. These youth are hearing this every single day. And then when they go to the teachers, the teachers are sweeping it under the rug like it isn't happening. And so when the youth gets it again and they actually strike out because they're just so frustrated, then they're labeled as a violent uh, uh, youth. It goes on their record, they get suspended, they get expelled, they get in trouble with their families, and we're no longer okay with that. Uh, some of the things I do want to make sure that we understand here as well is racism uh, and discrimination is systemic. We have elders that are behind youth ambitions, that are, are, are setting behind us and help guiding us. We are not doing this on our own ambition. Uh, we, we look to our, our elders. We have Elder McCarthy, Mary McCarthy, who uh, uh, without her, her guidance, without her uh, uh, experiences, uh, we wouldn't be able to navigate the way we do. Uh, we have Brother Raymond Times, Elder Raymond Times, who was with us. We look to him for guidance. Um, and it's time to speak truth to power. Um, it's easy to push us out and admit the, uh, admit the truth, but unfortunately, they would rather defend their friends and rather than just speak the truth. There are a lot of people getting funding right now uh, that is afraid to go uh, up against the, the government to, because they're afraid that they're gonna lose some funding. This is the sole reason why Youth Ambitions does not go for government funding and because we know how that, that works. We know how the dance works. And I, I'm gonna use a term that maybe some of us understand is, Youth Ambitions and Ted Harris, who is the executive director and founder of Youth Ambitions, is not looking to be the next Uncle Tom. We're not looking to be somebody who ha are, are having strings on us in order to do what we need to do, and that is fight the system, fight to, against that power um, that has been set up in New Brunswick. Um, and it's a sad uh, part that the government and those in power allow it to happen and then hide behind their lawyers in order to claim um, um, that this isn't happening. Um, we want to make sure that racism is real. We want to make sure that we understand that here in Canada, because Canada actually has this thing where we think that we are not, we do not have racism. Uh, we didn't have slavery, but in which we did. We, we still have those issues that are coming from that. Um, it is also so rampant in the school system as the curriculum and the educators are never taught that, that difference matters, diversity matters, and that we all matter. Uh, when we have leaders who cover things up and do not recognize the evil and the prejudiced ways of educators and politicians, um, how can we rank and file everyday citizen uh, uh, um, um, changes and uh, everyday citizens' stories? And how do we actually do that? Um, 
we hope that this is the platform that we are actually uh, ranking and filing all of those those stories and then we're actually putting them and implementing them. Um, we want to make sure that everyone here knows that right now, currently in the school system and the justice system, Youth Ambitions is helping to rank and file everyday community members with support. We are here to listen, to hear, to validate all the racism and hurt that happens on the typical day in school. It's not easy. I'll be honest. Uh, we're not only living through our own lived experiences, but we're also living through the experiences of our youth and our families on a daily basis. And we're trying to fight it. And there is absolutely zero supports on the other side. So we're hoping, so, short story, that those of you who are listening today, those of you who have organized this platform for us, that you uh, become that resource, that you become that support, that we don't let this just be a place where we talk, that we use this place where we can actually definitively make action. Uh, and thank you for hearing me. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ted. I think you broke it down beautifully. And, and this is something that we needed to hear. Um, hopefully, we're able to come back to you for final words. But um, uh, this is very important. So thank you for that. Um, I'll just uh, pass the mic to um, Tiger so we can continue with our uh, next guest. Thank you. Uh, Kiri Daniel, you are the CEO, executive director, and co-founder of Parents of Black Children a uh, Black student uh, advocacy, advocacy organized ba organization based in Ontario. Uh, behind Parents of Black Children is a whole story based on terrible effects. Would you be able to elaborate on the reasoning behind the creation of your organization? Thank you. Yes, I can. Um, I want to start, though, by, by recognizing Michael and the story that he shared and his um, experience within the education system and Michael, I just want to say that the integrity that you showed um, in standing up for Black children and advocating for Black children and the, the risk um, that came with that for your own family um, is, it is, it absolutely is a human rights infringement. It is horrific. Um, and it is the story of too many of our educators um, in the education system across this country. So I'm sorry that you have had that experience. Um, but I also want you to know that there are many uh, who are like you. There are, our Black children are entering school, are entering these systems completely unprotected. There is nobody looking out for them. And when we have educators like Michael who are looking out for them, they are sidelined. They are moved. They are penalized. There is reprisal for those educators. And so we need people to, it cannot just be left to Black community advocates to um, rally around um, our people. We need accomplices. We need allies. We need everyone um, on the same page and recognizing what it is that's happening in our system. And when you ask me, you know, why Parents of Black Children was formed, it's precisely for this reason. We've there is a crisis in our education system. Yes, we are. We operate primarily in Ontario, but we are federally incorporated. We work across the province. We get calls from New Brunswick. We get calls from Quebec. We get calls from Alberta. We provide systems navigation support, which means we are when a, when a family comes to us, no matter what the issue is, it could be um, an educator using the N word in the classroom. It could be uh, a child being strangled. It could, we've had kids who've lost fingers in school due to neglect and racism. Um, no matter what it is, we stand beside, in front, around the parent. Um, our goal is, is transformational change. Um, we don't do a lot of programs. We do do some, but our, our main goal is transformational change. And why we exist is because there is a crisis in education systems across this country. It is the crisis of anti-Black racism. And the crisis knows no borders. It crosses regions and school boards across this country and into schools and regions in other countries. In fact, we have a chapter in the U.S., um, and we're in talks with a team out in the UK because they're also experiencing the same thing and have no support and are looking to create an organization um, that can provide that support to, fa to families. And we know that anti-Black racism is rooted and anchored in the history of colonialism, of, imper of imperialism, of patriarchy, of enslavement, and all underpinned by a belief in white supremacy. 
And for Black children, this crisis means that in Ontario, Black students are more than twice as likely as their white peers to be suspended at least once during high school. It means that because of their educational experience, Black students have a dropout rate almost twice that of their white peers. Um, while the graduation rate for Black students is 15 percentage points below white students, uh, Black students make up two and a half, Black students are two and a half times more likely to be streamed into non-academic programs. And we know that that's streaming and has impacts, lifelong and generational impacts for students and their, and their families down the road. Uh, black children are less likely to be identified as gifted. In fact, schools do not know what giftedness, what giftedness looks like in black children. Our kids are, mo are both invisible and hyper-visible at the same time. They are often the first to be problematized, identified as a problem, isolated, sent out of class. They are in most cases going to schools where from the moment they set foot in the door to the moment they come in contact with a custodian or the school administration team, no one um, looks like them. No one um, represents them. No one... Uh, they can identify with no one in that school. Um, and beyond the data, what we see, this crisis for us, what it looks like is, you know, we've had Black kids, families who've come to us and said, my child has woken up blind, unable to see due to the ongoing racism and trauma they've experienced. There's no reason for this other than it's a physiological response. Their body is shutting down and responding to trauma, which is racism. Race, racism is violence. It looks like black children as young as four being placed in isolation, in isolation rooms, otherwise known as calming or sensory rooms. It means kind kindergartners being removed from school and placed by themselves in the back of a police car without their parents knowing where they are. It looks like the gross neglect of black children who get hurt and then are left on the school playground with fractured limbs. Black children who have lost extremities, fingers, do the staff neglect in school. Black children subjected to arbitrary, unilateral, and illegal searches of their school bag or their person within a school. Black children forced to sit in class while their teacher recites the N-word or plasters the word, writes the, board, the word on the board under the guise of education. It looks like the lack of action when a Black child is the victim of an incident in school, but an overreaction when they are not. It looks like educators and school administrators being the number one referrer of Black children to children's aid societies, resulting in a gross overrepresentation of Black families in the child welfare system and an irretrievable break in Black family units. This is why parents of Black children exist. It's, we stand in the gap to support Black children and their parents as they navigate the education system. But we are also facing pushback. I'm as I'm in this panel, I'm also on my phone because we also we have been asking for over a year the Ontario Human Rights Commission to launch an inquiry into the anti-Black racism um, that our families experience, that our children experience in the education system. We have been we have launched campaigns around this. We have been demanding this for over a year. We have launched we've had a protest um, around this demonstration right in front of the OHRC offices around this. The Ontario Human Rights Commission has denied this request. They have said, oh, we don't have enough money. Well, we don't need another, we don't need another inquiry. We've done you know, a number of reports on, on Black children. And it's true, they have. They've done reports on segments of the Black experience, such as suspensions. They've done reports on you know, looking at, well, recently the right to read, which Black children are a small, tiny part of that, but they have never done a fulsome inquiry into what it, it what the experience is like for black children in the Ontario education system from JK to grade 12 and beyond across this province they've never done it and it's almost as if they're scared and so what they've done instead if they said we're not launching an inquiry um, we're going to do a roundtable discussion but you know they've held they they were holding a roundtable today and they didn't let us into the meeting and so as I'm talking to you here, I'm also on my phone trying to get into this Zoom meeting that the OHRC has, is having with other community members, but not parents of Black children. They have blocked us, the Ontario Human Rights Commission, from a meeting discussing our children. And that's, that's the type of pushback we're facing. The pushback comes in the forms of, you know, this, this provincial body responsible for upholding human rights, refusing to conduct an inquiry, and then, and then pushing out of 
the process um, to address this issue. It means that when we are applying for grants, um, there's a cost to the work that we do because we are vocal. We don't always get the grants and we're told, you know, it's our social media activity. We're, we're targeting politicians for our children. And so we don't get the money, we don't get the funding. So we have to look at other ways similar to what Ted was mentioning. It looks like educational membership bodies, in our case, the Ontario Principals Council and school boards tone policing black advocates, citing a lack of our civility and respect in, in the process of advocating for our children and framing us, framing us as black advocates as angry and threatening and intimidating all because we deign to speak out on behalf of black students. It means, it looks like preventing us, preventing black advocates across this province and beyond from, from attending meetings to support parents. So sometimes we will go to meetings with parents and the parents are being asked to choose which one advocate they want to come into a meeting with them. We are physically blocked. I have been in a meeting with the director of education where my staff has been in the, in the waiting room and I've had to get up myself and go and get my staff to bring her into the meeting because the, the director is refusing, saying there's enough people in this meeting. As if, you know, being in a room faced with a number of Black people is somehow scary. This is a crisis. Black advocates and advocacy organizations, such as parents of Black children, cannot fight this alone. We need the help of supporters and allies and accomplices across this country. And the fact is, this is a war. It is a war for the humanity of our children. We don't wanna sit in meetings with parents and have to beg for support from school boards because their child is trying to scratch the black off their skin. We don't wanna sit and support mothers who have to sleep on the floor of their child's room at night just to make sure that they, they don't kill themselves while unsupervised because they've been left devastated and broken and hollowed by the relentless misogynistic anti-black racist bullying. We provide support to these families. We've created a systems abuse report. You can see it on our website. It details the instances of anti-Black racism across the province that we've seen so far. We've collected victim impact statements. In fact, we collected over 60 and we sent those to the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Again, they denied us the right to an inquiry. We have created an educator's toolkit, a guide to combating anti-Black racism and decolonizing their classrooms for teachers. This has gone all across the province to school boards in both French and English. We have created a separate nonprofit dedicated to providing workshops and education through a knowledge exchange center to at least teach educators and, and try and dismantle some of the anti-Black racism that's happening in their classroom. It means that advocates, many made up from staff, from grassroots organizations like ours, are working more than full-time hours uh, to support parents on pay that is very small. We've also created an education systems navigation guidebook for parents, workshops for Black parents, a tutoring program, a mental health fund, because we know the impact of racism it, it impacts our mental health and our children's mental health. We have a partnership with the Black Legal Action Clinic to ensure all families can access education advocacy through a legal lens, regardless of their income. We have and are collectivizing Black parents together across the province because we know that white supremacy and racism thrive in silence. And often two Black students can be experiencing the same racism, sometimes at the hands, hands of the same perpetrator, and neither will ever know because they don't talk about it, their parents don't talk about it. So we're trying to bring parents together too many of us fight alone and our children are limping across the graduation st stage years later with invisible scars and barely healed battle wounds. Many of them, when they get to university or college, they come back to us and they start, it's only then when they're, they've had a little bit of distance from, the, from their elementary and secondary experience that they're able to process what happened to them. And sometimes they'll come back and tell us those stories. We're tired. I'm tired. We need white and racialized parents, white and racialized educators, white and racialized organizational leaders, white and racialized politicians to be just as unafraid and unapologetic in their support of combating and stamping out anti-racism in our education system in all its forms. We can't do this by ourselves. I'll leave it there.
Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm going to hand uh, I'm going to hand this back to uh, Ely quickly. Thanks so much, Tiger. I feel like there's so much information we would need a lot more than just an hour, but um, we'll we'll do it what we can. So I'm just going to go through the Q and A um, that we've received so far. Um, there was one question from uh, Ms. Sidit, who I, I salute. Um, so one question was uh, for um, for Ted. So the question was, um, what solutions would you propose to improve the system um, to be better equipped to combat racism and systemic racism in New Brunswick? Like what's needed and what does your ideal uh, team would look like? Well, the ideal team right now would be different from the team I see currently. And that would be having uh, um, Black the black community and the native community having elders setting on the board um, that makes these decisions in our school. Um, right now we have people making decisions um, that are part of the problem and and we need to start really looking at uh, who is on these boards. Um, and you know we do have a, a, another issue of you know we we will have educators and people in higher places that will say yeah we have uh, uh, we have uh, 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 black people or native people on our boards but my question is to them what type of role do you have on this board uh, because if you're not making the changes that are are supposed to happen with all of our lives um, then I'm kind of questioning why you're there in the first place beyond the facial we have and type of thing. Um, so we need we need results. That's that's the greatest and biggest thing. We need a multi uh, disciplinary uh, uh, um, uh, uh, board um, that consists of people representing from these cultures, um, so that when we are uh, uh, handing down. Um, these disciplinary actions that they make sense for everybody. Thank you so much for uh, the response. Um, obviously, we have to be mindful of time. So um, we, we hope that the people that are here really uh, take this information to heart and that we have more opportunities to dive deep into this. I, I think I'm still shook from the impact of those words. But um, until then, I'm going to pass it up to Tiger for the conclusion. Uh, thank you, panelists, uh, for sharing. Um, I'm first going to just start with uh, giving thanks to our panelists, Michael, Ted, and Kiri, our partners, La Foundation uh, Communitaire de la Pensola Kitty, and the Canadian Race Relations Foundation, our broadcast partner, Rogers TV, our translators, uh, David Lewis, Sarah Thalong, and Herbert Francis, uh, the staff for moderating the webinar, our viewers and participants, uh, most importantly. Uh, we invite you to join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time for the continuation of this public dialogue. We will be uh, discussing the impact of racism on youth uh, and the impact that can have uh, repercussions across generations. And we will also travel from New Brunswick to Saskatchewan to explore how various initiatives and curriculum are being modified to include Black history and Indigenous perspectives. Uh, see you all tomorrow. Merci. Thank you. Walalan and Walalan. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.